My name is Onisha Asimo Caesar. I'm the founder and owner of Fulton Street Books and Coffee right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. At Fulton Street, we center the stories, the narratives, the lived experiences of Black, Brown, Indigenous, and other marginalized voices. As a lover of books and history and learning and knowledge, I stand strongly against the practice of banning books in this country. Book bans are our most widespread form of censorship. That censorship undermines the principles of our democracy and the free exchange of ideas that are critical to a healthy society. And as we all know, book bans exist in direct opposition to one of our most fundamental rights, the freedom of speech. That First Amendment, which guarantees freedom of speech and expression, which includes access to ideas and information, even if those ideas and that information is deemed controversial or unpopular. Book bans infringe on our intellectual freedom, the ability of each person to access information and share ideas without restraint. When we don't ensure that all voices are heard or the whole story is told, or we leave out pieces of the truth, we do ourselves, our communities, our children, and our future a great disservice. We all deserve the freedom to learn. So read a banned book today, share a banned book today, gift a banned book today, and call your elected officials and tell them we don't need book bans. We all deserve to see ourselves, our stories, our cultures, our histories, our ideas reflected on the pages and on the shelf. I feel like if we ban books, most kids won't learn about like certain cultures that they've been exposed. I haven't learned about like Madame T.J. Walk. I haven't no, I didn't know about Madame T.J. Walk. And if you think about it, most black like kids that have like the color of color don't know about certain people that's in Black History Month because they're always doing the same things over and over again because they always see the movies, those books. They if we ban bo certain books like this, we can't understand. We can't learn more about more people and more towns and more like have their own opinions and have like their own way to say things and the right to speak i feel like books they shouldn't be banned they're important part of humanity as a whole like if we ban these there's so much knowledge missed learning opportunities and like ch children are in school for like what a, like maybe a fifth of their lives so like all this reading that's just not gonna you know they're not gonna have libraries or anything it's like all the librarians will lose their jobs if this happens. We can't let this happen. This is a terrible idea. Yeah, I don't, I'm not okay with this. I feel obviously a little angry about it because um, those authors spend a lot of time on those books and editing them and trying to spread the message. And the government is just trying to ban books of people of color. And as a person of color, reading about like brown creators and brown authors and the books that they make make me feel a little more comfortable in my shoes and a lot like i learn a lot more about my culture than i used to know and also about other cultures and i think that reading them obviously helps your knowledge a lot more and kids should learn about that because a lot of people of people of color and lgbtq communities experience a lot of discrimination discrimin oh my god i get to the word like they get really discriminated against and um, I think that learning about it will obviously help you in the future and it puts a really bad like name on the government if they want to do that and I think a lot of people will write it about it not write it but like protest about it like, yeah banning books makes me feel really mad because books like The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas make kids realize that their words can hurt and books with LGBTQ plus characters makes kids feel like they're accepted in the world and that it's not weird to be like them it's perfectly normal okay um i think it's important to have books that like show your identity so you can learn who you are and who you represent like figuring out the sexuality and like ways that you want to express yourself and if they take away those books how are you going to do that like let's be honest right now I think we should not ban books because um, there is a lot of history in these books that people like politicians are trying to ban because they think like people of color are bad, which literally makes no sense because like that's dumb. And I think kids need to like, you know, read books about lots of, you know, topics that are widely discussed and like uh, people argue about because, you know, now they can form their own opinions and thoughts about things and uh, they won't have to just follow the crowd. 
So, yeah. Oh, um, I think the way that it makes me feel is that it's bad because I think you should have access to the access to the books that allow you to get common knowledge. So like. Also, like the past that happened to black people and the LGBTQIA plus. <laughs> I think it's um horrible still because when they have books, a lot of them have knowledge that most kids should know in school. So banning books like this makes me feel really angry because not only is there time, money, and effort put into these stories, these these this effort is being put to spread a message. That message, be it for about like people of color, the LGBTQ, and many others, silencing those messages and keeping them on the down low tells people, it's like saying, hey, you shouldn't be reading about this. This stuff is bad, which it is not. The government is trying to silence us from being free and being ourselves. And this is very, very detrimental to our society and how we are as people. Wow, that was amazing. That was truly amazing to start off by hearing from our man, really smart students here in the state of Oklahoma. Good afternoon uh, to most of you and good morning to those of you who are watching us on the West Coast. I'm Dr. Tiffany Crutcher with the Terrence Crutcher Foundation, uh, chiming in right here uh, on Black Wall Street, the historic in the historic Greenwood District in my office. And it is definitely an honor and a privilege to be able to participate in this Freedom to Learn, Freedom to Learn National Day of Action uh, with cities across this country, over 150 cities uh, in partnership with Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum. Uh, we had no choice but to participate uh, in this National Day of Action. We all know what's happening here in the state of Oklahoma and the attacks on our our, our ability to learn our history and, and be represented in books and to know where we come from. And so we are here, we are activated, we are motivated, and we will continue to fight against these attacks on our freedoms and our liberties. And so I'm, I'm thankful that uh, we have partners like the Black Wall Street Times and Black History Saturdays and our only Black bookstore, Black-owned bookstore in the city of Tulsa, Fulton Street, uh, books and Coffee, and our Oklahoma Legislative Black Caucus. We have Senator George Young here with us. We cannot do this work alone. And so I'm excited to, to, to just read today. We want to read some of the books that are being banned, not just in the state of Oklahoma, but across this country. And so we're going to have some action steps for you so you can join this movement. This just isn't a moment. We're not going to stop fighting. We're just not activating on May 3rd, but we're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep making sure that our children know where they come from in the, their history. And it's going to take each and every one of us to make sure that this happens. I want to just share with you some of the books uh, that are being banned in our Oklahoma schools. So you will know because we have right now a banned book drive going on. And we want for you to drop some of these books off at some of the locations who decided to also partner with us. And so for black girls like me, I know why the caged bird sings. I'm just appalled. Uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Can you believe that? And, and you'll hear some excerpts from that book here shortly. A Raisin in the Sun, I grew up on that. How can you ban that? Shame on you, Oklahoma. Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, and The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Those are just a few books, but there are close to or over a hundred bands right now in the state of Oklahoma and, and so many more. I wanna shout out the, the, the Freedom to Learn Network. 
again, in the African-American policy forum for actually shipping us books like, like Stamp for Kids by, by Ibrahim Kendi and Jason Reynolds. We have All Boys Aren't Blue by George Johnson. We have Between the World and Me by T T Tanishi Coates. We have The Color Purple, one of my favorite books and movies of all times by uh, the great late Alice Walker and the 1619 Project, of course, by Nicole Hannah-Jones. We had the privilege of having her here uh, last year on the 101st anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. And you will hear, you will hear uh, an, an excerpt from her, her amazing project. And so what we wanna do, uh, we want to just read from a few of the banned books um, that's been banned for our kids. And we want you just to just enjoy. And I'm gonna start by reading uh, chapter two, Stamped for Kids. And, and this chapter is called Stolen Land, Stolen Lives, 1619 through 1688. In 1619, the first ship carrying enslaved Africans, African people arrived in the newly colonized America. America welcomed slavery with open arms and used it to build this new country. Years passed, more and more Europeans arrived too, running away from haters of their own and seeking freedoms and opportunities. Some of these new arrivals were missionaries, religious folks, who wanted to spread their religion, including Puritan ministers who followed strict religious rules. When they came to America, they set up churches and schools to teach their way of thinking that they were better than anyone who wasn't a Puritan and way better than Native American and African people. They taught those ideas in their churches and schools, which along with uh, Zarara's ideas and others, helped justify slavery for a long, long time because it was tied to church and school, which are basically the bacon and eggs of this country. Or maybe the bread and cheese, the meat and potatoes. You get the point. Americans acted like they were playing one of those video games where you have to build a world, except that's racist. Native Americans had already built a world but a social network of farmers and missionaries force, forcefully took over this native world by taking over their land. And what, were they, and what were they doing on that land? Planting and harvesting tobacco. Tobacco's not a big plant, but it can bring in big money. Rich Europeans would pay top dollar for tobacco to smoke and sniff. But if tobacco was really going to bring in big, big money and become the natural resource used to power the country, then farmers would need more human resources to grow it. You see where this is going? Slavery. But remember, America was full of church folk and dirt folk and the new enslaved Africans would cause a bit of conflict between the two. For the planters, slavery meant they didn't have to pay people to work the fields, so labor by those who were enslaved made them lots of money. For the missionaries, slavery meant new souls to convert to their brand of Christianity. Basically, planters wanted to grow profits while missionaries wanted to grow their church. No one cared what the enslaved Africans wanted, but I'm willing to bet they didn't want the religion of their enslavers. And they definitely didn't want to be enslaved. Some of the enslavers resisted the missionaries pressure to convert enslaved Africans. They didn't care as much about saving souls as they cared about saving their crops and making more money. Many enslavers even worried that if enslaved people had the same religion as them, they could no longer enslave them. So they made up racist excuses for why enslaved Africans couldn't be converted, like that Africans were wild and inhumane, unworthy of love from anyone, even from God. Wow, that was stamped for kids by Jason Reynolds and Ibrahim 
X. Kendi. I'll now turn it over to Christy Williams. My name is Christy Williams. I am the founder of Black History Saturdays, and I send greetings from my District 1 City Councilor, Vanessa Hall Harper, who couldn't be here, but she loves and supports Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, as we all do, and this movement that is so needed. And thank you, Dr. Crutcher, for making sure that we take part in this important, this very critical movement um, that is a threat upon education today. Um, and I will be reading from the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. I had resided but a short time in Baltimore before I observed a marked difference in the treatment of slaves from that which I had witnessed in the country. A city slave is almost a freeman compared with a slave on the plantation. He is much better fed and clothed and enjoys pr privileges altogether unknown to the slave on the plantation. There is a vestige of decency, a sense of shame that does much to curb and check those outbreaks of atrocious cruelty so commonly enacted upon the plantation. He is a desperate slaveholder who will shock the humanity of his non-slaveholding neighbors with the cries of his lacerated slave. Few are willing to incur the odium attaching to the reputation of being a cruel master. And above all things, they would not be known as not giving a slave enough to eat. Every city, every city slaveholder is anxious to have it known of him, that he feeds his slaves well, and it is due to them to say that most of them do give their slaves enough to eat. There are, however, some painful exceptions to this rule. Directly opposite to us on Philpot Street lived Mr. Thomas Hamilton. He owned two slaves. Their names were Henrietta and Mary. Henrietta was about 22 years of age. Mary was about 14. And all of the mangled and emaciated creatures I ever looked upon, these two were the most so. His heart must be harder than stone that could look upon these unmoved. The head, neck, and shoulders of Mary were literally cut to pieces. I have frequently felt her head and found it nearly covered with festering sores caused by the lash of her cruel mistress. I do not know that her master ever whipped her, but I have been eyewitness to the cruelty of Miss Hamilton. I used to be in Mr. Hamilton's house nearly every day. Miss, Ham Miss Hamilton used to sit in a large chair in the middle of, a, of the room with a heavy cow skin always by her side and scarce, at, and scarce an hour passed during the day, but was marked by the blood of one of these slaves. The girls seldom pass without her saying, move faster, you black gip at the same time giving them a blow with the cow skin over the head or shoulders, often drawing the blood. She would then say, take that you black gift, continuing, if you don't move faster, I'll move you. Added to the cruel lashings to which these slaves were subjected, they were kept nearly half starved. They seldom knew what it was to eat a full meal. I have seen Mary contending with the pigs for the awful thrown into the street. So much so, Mary kicked and cut to pieces that she was often called pecked than by her name. And I will now turn it over to Nehemiah Frank. Thank you so much, Christy. Hello everyone, I'm Nehemiah Frank, the founder and editor in chief of the Black Wall Street Times. And today I will be reading an excerpt for you from the 1619 Project. And I'll start with the context and then I'll move on to the poem. May 31st, 1921, following the arrest of a young black man who had ridden in an elevator with a white woman, a confrontation erupts between groups of black and white citizens at the courthouse in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In response, mobs of white residents, some armed by the city, completely destroyed the Greenwood District then one of the wealthiest black communities in the country, 
known as Black Wall Street and kill hundreds of black citizens. And this, in, this poem that Jasmine Manns wrote is inspired by our beloved community of Greenwood. The title of the poem is Greenwood. The whistle of an unnatural wind gave word there would be a lynching of a Negro boy who shined shoes. Not a rapist, just a boy, a child boy, teenage boy, 19 year old boy, still fresh in his days. And a wind that would not know the enormity of its crime until morning filled air with turpentine. An invasion led by Klansmen, a hate that would outdo itself to a menacing ritual of fire, wood, and blood. The bombs turned clouds into shadows of themselves. Single engine aircrafts hovered so low. The bodies under them thought the world was ending, and how could it not be? Run, Negro! 35-ish blocks, and a flame that spent days burning itself tired. 300-ish black folks murdered into enormity. Greenwood has a soggy muck clay, a damp inconsistency of earth, constitution, and bone. Some buried, homeless, in Oakland, some trampled beneath the dirt, a history tucked away in attic floorboards long enough to forget all it had was. America has a way of dancing with its own delusion, unable to keep count of its murders because it then would have to keep count of its murderers, its good neighbors. All insurance claims denied to the residents of Greenwood and business owners of Black Wall Street and left a people holding their memory through tongue, folklore, blood, postcards, and church tale. A people chasing a memory that wasn't supposed to become a memory at all. Mm. Wow, thank you so much, Nehemiah. Thank you so much, Christy. And without further ado, I would like to bring on uh, Senator George Young, someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I have the honor of serving alongside him uh, at, with the Square One Justice Roundtable Project here in Oklahoma out of the Columbia Justice Lab, and also uh, as a, a co-board member with Oklahomans for Criminal Justice Reform. And he is a fierce advocate in the Oklahoma legislature, not just representing Oklahoma or Oklahoma City, but representing people all across this state who are marginalized. And without further ado, I would like to have Senator George Young, Pastor George Young, share some words. Thank you, Dr. Crutcher. Christy Williams, thank you so much for your reading. It was lovely. It was encouraging. Brother Nehemiah Frank, my good friend, thank you so much. And then to the one and only Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, we do love you. We appreciate the work that you have put in uh, around this nation, not only in Tulsa to make things happen, but this idea of banning books, ban 1619 so that so that we won't get uh, Genesis 1-1 in the beginning. We won't know where we came from. Ban how we win the Civil War so we won't know that we can't overcome where we are and get to where we need to be in someone's lifetime that's living right now. Ban those books that create within us the ideas and thoughts that yes, we are better than where we are and we don't have to be stopped by those who want to ban books. Reading is fundamental. It is fundamental to grow. It is fundamental for us to become all we can become. Reading is fundamental to grief. It gives grief to those who would ban books to prevent us from being able to overcome where we are and let them know that we can be greater than where we are. Reading is fundamental to culture and lets us know who we are. Reading is fundamental to continuity, connects us to those who daily got up in the midst of the institution of slavery and overcame it daily. Reading is fundamental to fearlessness. 
doing things like we are doing right now, this protest in video form saying that we're not going to allow you to just say you're going to ban books. We're going to come back. Reading is fundamentals of faith that we believe that we can do and be whatever we believe we can be and become. Reading is fundamental to freedom, freedom that we have fought for, freedom that we have tried our best to maintain. Reading is fundamental to fallow ground where we can plant the seeds of life and see them grow and to become all that we need. Banning books makes voices unheard. Banning books makes votes uncast. Banning books tries to make victims of us. That's why I say in the midst of right now, in the midst of what you've heard, protest, go and buy a book, read a book, read it to your children. Let them know that they cannot stop our brains from consuming that which helps us to overcome the situations that they try to create. Ban books all you want and I'll show you how we will, how we shall, and how we will forever overcome. Oh my gosh, somebody go get a water hose because this is on fire right now. Thank you so much, Senator Young. And as he said, we need for you and Onika, you heard her say it, give a book, gift a book, bring a book. We have establishments where you can drop off banned books. And for those of you who have students in Tulsa Public Schools, and, and I'm gonna challenge uh, uh, folks and businesses all over this state, Oklahoma City, join in, uh, grab your bin, put it in your establishment, your organization, your office, and ask people to come and drop off banned books so we can get these books into the hands of the people. But right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you can go to the Black Wall Street Liquid Lounge right on Greenwood and, and, and drop off a banned book. You can go to Fulton Street Books and Coffee and drop off a banned book. You can come to the Terrence Crutcher Foundation and drop off a banned book right inside of the Greenwood Cultural Center. You can go to Silhouette Sneakers and Art right on Archer and Greenwood and drop off a banned book. And, and we have the Creative Suites off of Utica who just joined in, they reached out and said, hey, we want to be a part of this. And so we don't want to just stop here. We want to ban the book bin and every business and every organization who believes in the freedom to learn for our kids. And I want to dedicate this virtual read-in to my dear friend, Representative Mari Turner. This is for you. I want for you to know that we love you. We support you. We stand with you as you fight in that Oklahoma legislature. This is dedicated to you. Yes, we supported the Justins, but we support you right here in Oklahoma as well. We will stand with you. And I want to close with this, with this call to action. I need for everybody uh, to go on the Black Wall Street Times Facebook page and share this broadcast. Uh, I want for you to upload your profile pic because this is a national day of action and let them know that you believe in the freedom to learn. I want you to take a video selfie and share what freedom to learn means to you and post it on social media. And I want us to send a strong message, a strong message to our state superintendent and the Oklahoma legislators who have come against our liberties and our freedoms. This is a message if you're hearing our voice. And I wanna close with this and our generational vision for our children and their children. We envision a society where students, teachers, families, and community leaders in Tulsa and across the state of Oklahoma can see themselves in the classroom through representative works of literature, curriculum, and leadership. We see a society where we are not actively fighting to include books that explore important topics such as identity, race, and gender. That is our generational vision for justice and our generational vision for liberation. And so this is your call to action. Share this broadcast. Uh, shout out to Black History Saturdays. They do it every first Saturday of the month. Mrs. Christy Williams, who had a vision that has come to reality, and she didn't even know that we would be here with these attacks. She just knows that it is important because we know that history is the gateway to truth. 
and you may try to suppress our truth, but we know that truth crushed to the earth will always, always rise. Again, you all have joined our Freedom to Learn National Day of Action in Oklahoma. Thank you to Anika Asimor Caesar with Fulton Street Books and Coffee. And thank you to our beautiful, courageous students right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who had the courage to, to, to state what freedom to learn means to you. We have a voice and we're gonna use it. We love each and every one of you. I'm Dr. Tiffany Crutcher signing off right here in the historic Greenwood District, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Have a great day.